changing the slides. You have to come back and click them. Okay. Uh, Kyoto. Hello, good morning everybody. Morena. How are we going? I know you're still trying to get your, your programs and your, your uh, activities together. Great to, great to uh, see you here. Saw a few groups um, working away this morning, trying to think through um, their, uh, their campaign, so that's great. I hope you uh, enjoyed your agency visits and so on that you've had so far. Um, we had such a great kickoff on Monday. I thought that was actually spectacular. Those uh, four very impressive people giving you a rundown of um, their journeys and how they intersect with uh, with public health. So today we've got um, the population health in action. So this is where you learn about uh, what it's like to be a public health physician. What the public health space is all about. Um, I have to confess that I went clean through medical school. I went clean through my physician training. So, you know, what is all that, about 13 years or something, before I even knew what public health was all about. I mean, there was an asto astounding lack of um, teaching or training in public health or an astounding ignorance on my part, one or, one or the other. Um, and it wasn't really until I was medical director of the Heart Foundation, um, having come to it from a clinical background, that I really appreciated what population health was all about. And we were trying to get some action on, on smoking, on tobacco, and we formed the um, Smoke Free Coalition. And I learned from a few um, old hands, uh, old campaigners, about, uh, about how to campaign and how to get what we're targeting was a tax increase, a substantial tax increase in, in tobacco. And uh, Murray Logerson, who is uh, one of the stalwarts of, of um, tobacco control and public health physician, um, he kind of guided me and I was heading up this smoke-free coalition. And we went round all the MPs and we sort of pushed it in hard and we got all of our evidence together and we ran a proper concerted campaign, a little bit like you're working up. And at the end of it, then a, a, a tax came through and Murray pulled out a bit of a back of the envelope, bit of paper and said, well, what do you know? We've just saved the road toll every year. We've saved the road toll, you know, 400 lives a year or whatever it was that came. Now, nobody's going to thank us for that. We never acknowledge that's, that's, and we're a little piece of some statistic. But that sunk home to me, the kind of power of the impact of a population-wide um, intervention. And after that, I was sold. All right, so we're going to hear from uh, three fantastic um, people today, and I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves as, as we go. So we're going to start off with um, Dune Winard from Counties Manukau, and she'll tell you a little bit about her journey. OK, you can... Oh, yep. No, let me get down from there. Is that, yes. is that going? Actually, I don't hold it up, don't I? Just while Boyd's yep, there we are. bringing that up, thank you. Uh, so tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ngā mahi nui kia koutou, and to those online up in Northland, uh, ngā mahi nui to you as well. Um, so I'm originally from Taranaki, uh, primarily of Welsh and Scottish uh, ancestry, and then I came to Auckland to go to med school um, and have lived in the Bay of Plenty for a decade, and then Tamaki Makoto has been my home and my workplace now for some years. Um, 
so the slide talks about the bit I'm doing is talking about working as a public health physician in a DHB planning and funding environment as part of the COVID-19 response and then now we are in the new health system. So I'm just going to do a little bit at the beginning about, um, on behalf of the three of us who are talking this morning, and actually apologies um, from a wonderful Pacific colleague, Karina uh, Gray, who was actually going to be doing this um, session that I'm doing this morning, um, who's had to um, be away for some other work commitments. Um, but we're just going to talk briefly about some journeys to public health medicine and some of the variety of roles that we play, because just really want to emphasise that we're just a slice of the variety um, and the spectrum of places that people work and the roles that they end up doing as public health physicians. And also we're a slice in that we're the medical workforce and there are a whole range of people working in population and public health from all kinds of other professional and unregulated backgrounds as well who are a really important part of this mahi. Uh, so also going to talk about what our team was doing pre-COVID and then a little bit about what we were involved in over the three years of the COVID response and of course now we are in a new um, health system restructure. So this, is, this slide just kind of briefly maps my professional journey into public health medicine. So I actually um, went into general practice, did my vocational training in general practice and after some years in practice actually got quite involved in youth health. Uh, and eventually a youth health colleague said to me, have you thought about doing a master's in public health because you sound like you're kind of getting into that space and you can't actually do youth health without practicing population and public health. So I did that and so I actually did my MPH before joining the public health medicine program and then a colleague in public health said to me, what you are ending up is a GP with an MPH kind of with no professional place to call home and why don't you think about doing the public health medicine training and then you would have a place to call home and a colleague set that you would um, then work with and so that's what I did and I qualified in 2009 as public health physician and then went uh, to work in counties, what was already at counties Monaco actually as a um, registrar and carried on there. So this slide is really just saying you know, there are a huge variety of ways that people get to end up being public health physicians. So some people are really clear early on that this is the role for them. And as Boyd said, years ago you wouldn't have even known it existed at this point actually. But now that you have some exposure, some people go quite quickly, they might do their PGY2, and just as you might apply to another specialty training program, actually apply to do public health medicine training. Others of us take a more kind of evolving and convoluted journey um, and so certainly within our team who I'll introduce you to by photo we've got people who've done peds, general practice, adult medicine, someone who was strongly contemplating doing microbiology, we've got public health medicine colleagues who've worked in surgery before they've come to public health medicine so there are lots of different ways to get here and I've put the kitty there because however you get there all of the relationships, the expertise, the skills that you you build up along those journeys are actually a really important thing that you're actually bringing with you into your public health medicine practice. So this slide we've just tried to summarise um, a variety of the roles that people are in. So one of the things to be conscious of is that we, none of the three of us here this morning are actually medical officers of health and that's a really significant public health medicine role. Um, these people are now based in what's called the National Public Health Service. Previously it would have been called a public health unit and some of you may know of ARFS or Auckland Regional Public Health Service. And so these roles include um, environmental health, communicable disease, health promotion, regulatory functions, particularly around tobacco and alcohol. Um, so there is, even just within that kind of one role, there is this really wide spectrum of things that people are working across. There are a lot of people end up in advisor roles of various sorts and that can include service planning and development of programs, prioritisation, um, how we spend our resources across the system, policy development. So people are working in Manatu Haora, the Ministry of Health, Pharmac, um, Te Whatawara, which was previously our 20 DHBs, um, and Te Akawai Ora, our new Māori Health Authority along with others. Um, so we've just, there are some photos scattered around this slide of some people that you might recognise from their media presence in various ways and I won't introduce all of them. 
the role of research and teaching, um, there are people right across the Motu and tertiary institutions who are working at a really high level from an academic expertise perspective and those of us who are kind of working in other roles in the sector are drawing all the time and it's about that translation and often our, I think our public health academic colleagues that whole interface of translation and how research gets used is a really important priority for them because that's the way that they are, that's why they've gone in in the first place and the way that they're trained to think about things. Some people are in quite um, analytical roles where they are not just advising but operationally kind of doing number crunching and epidemiology kind of hands on stuff as well as leadership in those spaces. And then in all of those kind of settings and in all of those pathways, people end up in leadership and management um, across not just necessarily the population and public health aspects of what they're doing, but across some of the wider system stuff because we get exposed across the system. And there's lots of roles that go across and people use words like boundary spanners and um, I will say in the last slide, you know, we, we are talking about ourselves in the new system as whole of system clinicians. Uh, and so there are various ways that we kind of talk about that. So that's a bit of context in terms of we are a slice of all of that. Uh, going back to what we were doing in Counties Monaco, so if you had seen a, an ad for a day job in our previous team, uh, you would have been invited to join, there was a directorate which our team was part of, we would be seeking someone who was flexible and adaptable and you would be thinking about population health thinking, analysis and leadership as the kinds of stuff that you would get involved in. And we would tell you that you would be in a supportive collegial environment, you would be providing this kind of advice and support, you would be involved in the strategic and annual planning, and you would support public and population health initiatives. So we work really closely with us as a public health unit for the things that were happening in the Rohi that we serve. Um, and it was a pretty big kind of organisation that we were part of. So Te Whatuora now as a national organisation um, has something like 80,000 employees and a budget of I think something like $24 billion. Um, don't quote me on the actual numbers. Uh, we certainly as an organisation had over 9,000 people working across 100, um, more than 100 different roles and more than 20 sites just across the Rohe of Counties Monaco. Um, so a wide and varied workforce working across quite a, a space of contrasts actually. Uh, and we had a budget of nearly $2 billion that we were responsible for. So this is a busy slide, but for me it's a really important slide because I'm really here kind of on behalf of our team and we certainly would say we think two and two equals five when you get us, um, that actually part of the value that we add is that we support each other, we ask hard questions of each other, we work in ways that mean that actually we can bring the value of the people in our team, not just ourselves, to the table. This is a bit of an old photo, we all look a bit older than that now. Um, but you can see the blue boxes describe the kinds of things that people are involved in and you'll see that there is a huge variety in there and that's just within our space. So Sarah's led for us and I'll talk a little bit about an alcohol harm reduction program that she really spearheaded, smoke free, commercial determinants and I think hopefully you're learning now about commercial determinants as well as social determinants of health. Um, Pip did a lot of peds before she came to public health medicine and she's led for us in the child and youth space. So things like rheumatic fever, work, um, well child, education interface, truckloads of stuff in that space, it's really important. Um, Anne's had a particular focus on intersectoral and social determinants work and I'll talk a little bit about the social wellbeing board work that she's been involved in. Um, I've, because of my general practice background, worked with our primary care and localities colleagues and I'll talk a little bit about a role on a thing called Funder Forum in terms of the way that we allocated resources. Um, Wing's done a lot of work around critical appraisal, um, funding models, bed modelling, but he's also done a lot of adult, adult medicine before he did public health and so he's been um, doing a lot of work in the CBD and diabetes space. Suniva is Samoan and she's led for us um, in terms of healthy weight and also Pacific health contributions. Shanti is, um, you may know from her time at School of Population Health, is working in building research, um, population health research capacity across um, into the clinical space and also um, got an interest in trauma and population health approaches to trauma. 
so we've been led by Gary at the bottom there, who is an, a very esteemed um, colleague who's been around public health for a long time. Uh, and he, particularly in the areas of kind of health service development and funding and planning, um, and we will come back to him a bit later on as well. We've had um, Summer, who's our population health program manager, who's a really key part of our team. And then we've had registrars, we have analysts, and we've had a health economist as part of our team at one point as well. So you can see there's a real breadth. And if you can imagine a team that are used to kind of Vanessa and I were just talking before, we rub up against each other in ways that the good things rub off and we also rub the sharp corners off each other as well. And so I think that that's a really important part of the way that we practice. This slide is just to try and talk briefly about the work that Sarah led in terms of our alcohol harm minimisation program. So the Ministry of Health has um, historically funded smoke-free contracts in various parts of the sector, but there hasn't been a lot of investment in terms of alcohol harm minimisation programs. And so Sarah had to actually build the case. She had to describe the problem, explain the context. She had to build a case. That triangle was a way of trying to kind of quantify the impact, the number of people that were affected in different ways. Um, really building on this really important report, Alcohol in Our Lives, um, and the work of others in the sector. And then something that spans the whole system. So this is talking about approaches within clinical settings in terms of um, brief advice, right through to working with our communities, particularly in one of our Māori wardens that's really spearheaded from a Tetsuriti or Waitangi um, perspective, some of the issues around the current sale and supply of liquor act. So spanning right across. Um, Anne has worked a lot with our South Auckland Social Wellbeing Board. So this is an initiative, a place-based initiative, which has got 13 government agencies and local council around the table. Uh, and it's really about trying to understand the issues for whānau on the ground and then reflect back into system change. So what do we need to do in the system to actually improve the way that whānau are receiving support or the things that they want to receive on the ground? So it's not about developing new services in that space, it's really about testing and learning and then trying to push the learning back into the system. And particularly around some of that kind of evidence and insights from that learning and how you push that up the chain is something which Anne has spent a lot of time in really focused on early, best, year, um, best start, early years, so whānau with um, tamariki five and under, uh, and all of the things that go in that space. Just briefly in terms of funder forum um, was something that I was part of, which was really about where the DHB was investing funding. And so we would receive um, all of the business case stuff before it actually went to our executive leadership team. And our job was really to ask the hard questions, to review, to have people think about what things they hadn't covered, what might be the unintended consequences of what they were talking about doing. And I've got this picture of a trade-off there with two green things because the thing about trade-offs is usually it's not about there's a really obvious not great option and a good option. It's actually that there are many good options and we're actually having to choose between them because we do have scarce resources and so we actually have to make hard choices. And if we're serious about our Tetsuriti responsibilities and equity, we are going to have to make some really tough choices actually going forward because it is a limited bucket. Um, so, and I've just put a note there that data and evidence are really important but actually there's a lot of things where you end up having to make judgment calls, and it's about being really transparent and explicit about how those calls are made. So that was day job. Then COVID happened. Uh, we turned up for a two-hour meeting in March 2020. Uh, some of us got to leave nine weeks later, but continued to be on call for all the surges. Some of us, myself, actually didn't get to leave until February this year, so it was pretty much three years. Um, Part of our team was with the AFS contact and um, case management, when you probably saw and heard a lot about that in the media. I ended up on the health system side of things, and so I've just got some little titles of various things we ended up working on, things like um, there was a clinical advisory group which I supported. I know more about PPE than I ever wanted to know uh, and trying to get access to PPE for various parts of our sector. Um, healthcare workers who were exposed, messaging out to primary care, building the whole vaccination program uh, and all that that involved um, is quite a story really. 
I was part of a team which were clinical support plus planning and intel, so things like working out how many hospital beds we might need in a surge, um, how do we track vaccination coverage, is it equitable, how are we going to feed that you know, to our Māori and Pacific colleagues and others who are working really hard in that space, how do we support them. What about our age residential care facilities? All that kind of stuff. Privacy issues, how do you get results out to people, make sure you respect their privacy, and also feed this up to the eternal suction in Wellington that wanted data about everything. Um, the little graph at the bottom is one of Gary's modelling. Gary ended up with some of his models being held up by Jacinda because they were operational models telling us what it would look like in the system, whereas the modellers that you normally saw cited were kind of at a higher level about you know, the community and wider implications. So now what? Uh, we are now part of a national organisation, Te Whatu Ora. We are part of a service improvement and innovation directorate. We are trying to figure out, for instance, how do we partner, how do we be you know, the best treaty partners we can be with our colleagues in Te Akawai Ora, um, how do we support equity aims for other populations, in particular our Pacific, our um, Whaikaha um, populations with disability, the whole vision of Pai Ora. Um, we're calling ourselves whole of system clinicians. We work across stuff, so we have to figure out how we kind of join the dots. Just to say, in terms of kind of competencies for these environments, things like written and verbal communication skills, we're often doing briefings for executive leadership teams and boards and things, so you do spend a lot of your time with documents. Um, chairing meetings, facilitating workshops, that role I talked about in Funder Forum in terms of asking hard questions, it's not necessarily a popular role, often, actually, um, and so you have to be able to figure out how you frame things. And you do have to, in terms of time management, we don't have clinics that stop or get done by someone else when you go on holiday. So it is quite a challenge, actually, to go on leave and come back to something that's actually not a nightmare. So we work in messy political places. Resilience, personal resilience, collective resilience is really important. Um, this idea of the stewardship of public resources is a really important thing that we're very conscious of a lot of the time and, and how we practice well in that space. And then just this idea, which you might want to think about, about being a trusted advisor. So Margie Apa, who is now the CEO of Te Whatuwara, was actually our boss at Counties at one point. And she talks a lot about being a trusted advisor. And, and the kind of questions that you ask yourself, you know, why, why should the people that you're advising trust you? Um, you need to understand their business. You need to know what they need. And you need to do what you say you're going to do. And in the mix of all of that, you need to be able to ask your HUD questions in a way that you know, people will receive the challenge and not wish that you went in the room, really. So that's uh, pretty much where I thought I would leave it and handing over to Vanessa. Sure, thanks very much. Thanks so much, um, Dean. Do you want this, or are you good? No, you're right. Um, what a what a breadth. Um, you know, yes, yes, uh, Monday you got uh, a huge insight into um, different individuals' journeys, um, and I hope today you're getting a sense of the breadth of population health. Um, so now we're going to hear from um, Vanessa Selak, who's a public health physician in the School of Population Health, a colleague of mine, and she's in this academic public health space and going to talk a little bit about her story. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Boyd. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's a great privilege to be here um, with, um, with this amazing panel and with Boyd and with Anna. And it's really awesome that you've got the opportunity to find out a little bit more about public health at this stage in your career, because um, even though my medical training was a little bit later than Boyd's. Um, I sort of had a similar experience in terms of not really understanding what public health was, not really um, appreciating the depth and the breadth of roles that could be possible uh, within, within public health. Um, I think whilst um, Doon has given us a really good overview about the types of roles that people undertake in public health, I'm going to focus on more of a personal journey. Uh, I um, have been someone who I think was quite directed in terms of where I was heading career-wise in my earlier life. And it felt like I was on a clear career trajectory. Um, I certainly was very clear in my mind about wanting to do clinical medicine. So once I got into um, medicine, I felt like I basically 
a lot of the decisions about my career development had already been made for me. It was, you know, there were set subjects I had to do. I had to get through various hurdles. And through that process, I was um, very interested in psychiatry. And so my sort of career trajectory was around aiming towards um, completing training in psychiatry and then becoming a psychiatrist at the end of it. Um, things didn't work out quite the way that I thought that they would. And I think my sort of career journey has been about having a much deeper appreciation of actually who I am as a person, what my values are, and what are the things that I enjoy doing, what are the things that actually make me feel satisfied and are satisfying for me. And what I really realised, um, I sort of had this kind of um, moment where I realised I was on the wrong path, and I'd just been on call um, for um, the psychiatric inpatient unit, and I was seeing a patient at Takapuna police station, who I think had been picked up after having poured gasoline in their gumboots and were standing in the middle of the road. And he was in a very bad state. And But actually, whilst talking to him, I sort of realised, well, actually, I was feeling pretty unhappy about where I was work-wise. And I just felt like work wasn't fitting for me. It wasn't, it wasn't really connecting the dots. And I just kind of thought about, well, if I stay in the same career path, sure, the career is mapped out for me. Um, but I kind of decided, actually, I'm just going to get off this path and I'm going to see what else I can find because this is just not working for me. So I spent a bit of time in the desert and um, I spent a lot of time doing different sorts of jobs, trying to work out, well, what do I actually want to do when I grow up? You know, I've invested all this time in a medical degree. Um, my parents were beside themselves. Um, I'm a second generation New Zealander. My parents are from Croatia. They essentially were peasants where they came from. So, of course, for them, having a daughter that was a doctor was a very big deal because they could sort of brag about it. But um, the difference was for me on a personal level, it actually just wasn't working for me. And I could just feel myself, um, I don't know, kind of just dissolving, actually. It was a really horrible feeling. Um, and I, I hope that none of you feel that way. But if you do, or if you get to that point, I want to tell you this story so that you know that there is actually a way through it. Um, so what I did first was that I found another job where, where I could use my medical skills, and that was in medical writing. And some of us who've ended up in public health or non-clinical medical type roles have, have gone on a similar pathway and ended up in Albany uh, working for ADIS. Um, I ended up working for them doing a standard uh, medical writing job and then joined their um, team at Taka Takapuna working on Clinic Answers, which has now become Clinic Guide. And the whole idea behind that um, service was to provide actionable information for clinicians at the bedside. Um, and that was a really fun group to work with, but I couldn't really see a career plan in it. I mean, I enjoyed the analytical work, I enjoyed engaging with literature, um, but I kind of couldn't see a career pathway for me within that. As part of doing that job, I did a paper on clinical epidemiology. It's a paper that's still run um, today. Um, and that, again, strengthened my um, understanding of and made me more interested in understanding research. But I still didn't really have a career pathway and I was feeling quite lost. At that point we had a, um, one of my friends put me in touch with uh, their family friend, Chris Bullen. I don't know if any of you have engaged with Chris, but he seems to be a common uh, denominator of many career pathways into public health. Uh, but essentially he was generous enough to take the time to talk with me about you know, what his job was like as a public health physician. And I was a bit unsure. I was a lot more cautious at this point in time. And I thought, well, why don't I just put my toe in the water and see whether public health might be the right fit for me? Um, fortunately, um, Chris had a part-time job going. So I was able to work with him on a um, cellulitis project that was based in Glen Innes. And this, was, this project gave me a real chance to appreciate the broader determinants of health because whilst my job was speaking with the GPs about which antibiotics patients in Glen Innes uh, were receiving for their cellulitis, um, I was working with a health promoter, Terry Morgan, who was actually going into people's homes and finding out, well, what is, what, what, what is the living circumstances of people that are getting skin infections um, that, and what might be happening in these environments that might be contributing to skin infections? And I guess that was where my kind of aha moment came, and I kind of realised, well, 
Obviously, the antibiotics are important, but equally so is actually having an appreciation of people's context, where they're coming from, because it doesn't matter how many antibiotics you give people, if they're living in an environment where they don't have hot water, where they don't have soap, um, where they have um, tyres filled with stagnant water that are mosquito breeding grounds, you know, unless you actually address that, you're probably not going to make much headway in terms of reducing um, hospital admissions for cellulitis. So I was kind of hooked, um, and I thought, OK, that's it. I know what I'm doing now. I'm going to do public health. I applied and thankfully got accepted onto the program. I think it's a bit harder these days. Somehow, for some reason, public health has become a lot more popular. I wonder why. I won't blame Ashley or anything. But um, anyway, nonetheless, um, thankfully, we actually have more funding for public health medicine training places. So that's really um, exciting uh, for us, um, and I think for the country as well, actually, because as Dune said, um, we absolutely need people working at the interface with our patients, but we also need people who can take a medical view and actually look at our health, our health system from a medical lens, which is what I think is one of the beauty, I think that's one of the really amazing roles that we can play as public health physicians, whether we're working um, as Dune has been working extensively in the health service or through medical officer of health type roles or through academic roles or through um, NGO roles. Um, now, whilst I was doing my public health medicine training, I did a Master of Public Health, and that really gave me a really strong appreciation of analytical skills, quantitative analytical skills, and an appreciation of the socioeconomic, the, the social gradient, which is that you know, really strong association that we see between socioeconomic um, deprivation and a myriad of adverse health outcomes. And that really twisted, that really, really pivoted my thinking, because I, up to that point, I was very much of the view that you know we have quite a lot of control and power in terms of where we end up in our lives. And that made me realise when I could see this, these patterns borne out in multiple diseases that actually, you know, people aren't choosing, people don't choose to be poor and they don't choose to have worse health, health outcomes. You know, it really gave me a strong appreciation that there's actually much more going on in terms of generating health than what an individual can do. Um, and whilst definitely what happens at the interface between a patient and a clinician is really important, again, these broader issues are so are really important to consider in terms of optimising people's health. And I think it was at that time that I began to sort of really connect with, reconnect actually with the values that I had probably originally had when I got into medical school, but which I'd kind of lost a little bit. And they were really around justice, um, and they were around, you know, rather than maybe doing the best for the patient in front of me, but actually thinking about providing the best equitable health services for the population, so taking more on board these utilitarian principles. Once I finished my Master of Public Health, um, I then did registrar placement. So you just, as a, as a public health um, registrar, the, your part one is the Master of Public Health, uh, which I did as part of the training program, but some people like Dune have already done the MPH before they get into the program. And then you do registrar placements, which are generally six to 12 months, kind of similar to, well, actually quite different to, <laughs> quite, quite different to the registrar placements you might do um, for other specialty um, Trade training programs. And I guess what I discovered through these placements was a joy of working on projects. And I think what I found that I what I found quite difficult and didn't really sit with me well in terms of clinical work was that sense of that quite um, short-term interaction, uh, which whilst you know, really important, it actually wasn't very fulfilling for me. And what I discovered about myself was that actually I preferred to be engaged in work where I was able to think, have the time to think, think more, think slowly and carefully about where I, about interpreting what was happening, analysing and coming up with a plan to move forward. The other thing that I discovered through these placements was that I really enjoyed working as part of a multidisciplinary team. And, um, I guess I found that working clinically, whilst you do have a team, um, I felt like working within, working within teams as part of the public health training program gave me a much stronger sense of teamwork and ability to be able to draw on a greater breadth of expertise. And I found myself increasingly really enjoying working as part of a team, contributing in my own way, but also being able to draw very heavily on expertise of other um, contributing individuals. 
So in terms of my registrar placements, I did one working on a cardiovascular polypal, which was a really exciting project because what I hadn't really appreciated up to that point was that we, you know, got this amazing evidence and research about what works, but you know, how much of that is actually ever implemented in practice? And the polypal trial I worked on was a really, really quite a simple approach of looking at how to en enhance implementation of evidence around what works for preventing cardiovascular disease. Um, there were a lot of challenges in undertaking the trial, um, but nonetheless um, that trial ended up continuing uh, further down the track and I'm still battling with Pharmac to get them to fund the polypill, but um, these battles continue. And um, So my focus is very much, rather than um, on the social determinants of health, my focus actually has become how can we implement evidence-based care and clinical practice and what techniques can we use to do that at a population level. I did a couple of other placements. One was with the planning and funding team in Waitemata District Health Board, Waitemata District Health Board, and then within the public health unit. Um, and at that point, I was still not really too sure where I wanted to go within public health. I sort of felt like I'd clarified that I was happy working within the public health field, but as Dune has illustrated, there are actually lots of pathways within public health and no set direction to take and I found that quite sort of bewildering a bit initially um, but I ended up taking a succession of jobs that have in retrospect helped me work out actually where I need to be going at this point in time. So um, I ended up working, going back to the DHB, uh, working as a, um, as a consultant, um, being a sort of a, in a clinical advisory role um, and then I ended up taking up an opportunity to undertake a PhD on the cardiovascular polypill. And that was, again, a really great opportunity to learn how to run a trial. And as part of that research, I developed um, a real love for quantitative analytic skills. Unfortunately, there weren't any permanent jobs available at the university. So what I ended up doing was applying for funding to do a post, essentially a postdoc, and that was on developing a bleeding risk equation, which I was able to do with data, collect, data that we already had available. And at the same time, I took up a job working at the Institute for Improvement and Innovation in Waitemata DHB, which is um, sort of um, a really, it was a really amazing place to work in because uh, it really gave me an opportunity to learn about quality improvement, which was an area that I had learnt about but really hadn't fully appreciated and it tied in really well with my desire to enhance implementation of evidence-based practice. So as, as part of my job with I3, I was working with clinical directors, um, working sort of in that translation space that Don, Don mentioned, working with um, clinical directors as well as our analysts to try to work out, well, how can we measure whether or not we're providing excellent quality care? And I was kind of astounded that um, you know, one area that I was looking at was what happens in the outpatient department. And I was astounded to discover that when I was speaking with these clinical directors, they weren't able to say, well, how many patients they have with particular conditions, because that information isn't stored, isn't available to be extracted and pulled out at a population level. So whilst the clinicians know what they're doing in terms of individual patients, in order to work out at a population level whether people are receiving what they should be receiving and trying to work out whether there are certain groups that are missing out or not, it's very hard to do that without having adequate um, information. And um, as part of my project with, um, the, with the I3, uh, I was able to work with a clinician to look at changing the data recording systems so that we could actually collect diagnostic information in the outpatient department. And we initially did that on a paper-based form, but then we introduced it as an electronic form. Um, so we were able to use digital technologies to enhance our ability to obtain clinically meaningful information on patients so we could actually take a much better population view of our, of our population um, rather than focusing on you know, um, pe people's att individual attendances or focusing on a, on a one-off audit. We were able to generate um, ongoing reports that would give us information about you know, what proportion of people were receiving appropriate care and therefore um, implement actions to address that. So um, I then ended up getting a um, transitioning from a research job at the university to a job that included teaching as well. And so um, I became a um, full-time um, lecturer at the university in 2018. And I guess since that time, I've managed to 
weave together um, a narrative that at least suits me, I think, that draws on all of these experiences that I had that seemed kind of unrelated at the time. So from my perspective, you know, what my focus is, is on using the data that we already have available rather than creating new da data necessarily, um, to see how we can best use that data to support improvements in healthcare quality and equity. So that pulls together the strands in my public health training in terms of appreciation of population healthcare and equity. I'm able to use my analytical skills, so and the numbers of people that we do analyses on, is we, you know, we're not restricted to the people we can recruit in a trial. The analyses that I'm working on are basically, you know, often whole of country analyses, and that's something that's really powerful um, that we're able to do in New Zealand that's not necessarily um, able to be done in other countries um, as well or as comprehensively. And the other aspect that I pulled into, I pulled into sort of my current area of work focus is around quality. So whilst it's great to come up with new ideas, uh, we actually also need to make sure that we implement things that we know already work. Um, and so that's a really exciting um, prospect for me, looking at how I can use my skills in a way that will support um, improvements in healthcare equity and quality um, using, using the skills that I enjoy using and working with people who have similar um, values. The ways in which I work are quite varied. Um, so I, Boyd did not tell you that technically I'm his boss. I know it, um, although it does feel a bit like that's a name only, doesn't it, Boyd? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the, so I've just recently been made the head of our department of EP and Biostats, which is, which is awesome because actually what it gives me a chance to do is to work really closely with our team of amazing um, researchers, some of whom are public health physicians, but many of whom uh, come from different backgrounds, to support their career development and aspirations. And that's been a real strong thing for myself. I think probably because I had so much trouble finding my own career pathway, I'm really keen on supporting others um, who have, for whom it's not been clear you know, what the next step is or where they might head. Um, I've pulled in the strand about digital health and I'm um, working with a team of amazing teachers in our school to develop a digital health tra training program. There's not much formal training in this area, but um, digital health is going to be a key, is a key enabler of helping us implement the health reforms um, and actually to get the most that we can out of the, um, the, out of the money that we have available to us within the healthcare system. I teach a couple of courses, um, one on quality and one on the New Zealand health data landscape. Um, I also have the privilege of supervising a number of people who are doing research projects. Um, that's both people who are doing PhDs and masters. And that's been, again, a really great way of um, not just sharing what I know, but also learning from the students who are doing these research projects and from my colleagues who I'm co-supervising with. So for me, it's already you know, really about working with teams. Another really exciting team that I work with is the Manawataki Fatu Fatu team, of which Karina Gray um, is one of the leaders of. So unfortunately, Karina can't join us because she's busy um, around the country um, doing a lot of important work for the Ministry of Health. Um, but she and Matari Harwood are co-leads of this program, which is focused on Pacific and Māori heart health. And increasingly, what I'm really enjoying doing is working with Māori Pacific-led projects and supporting the work of um, that the work of people that are leaders in those areas and supporting career development of our Māori and Pacific workforce. Um, because I think increasingly what I'm really recognising is that, you know, uh, we need to see authentic leadership of Māori Pacific run projects and that's something that I'm, um, you know, really passionate about. The other area that I'm involved in is in supporting our academic use of the health data collections which are generated through healthcare delivery. Um, and so I'm working with a colleague of mine to try to set up a platform to make it easier for people to access um, those data, to curate the data variables that we have available, to make it easier to undertake the research and to do it in a way that's much more efficient and effective um, and equitable actually in terms of ensuring that um, the analyses are done correctly and appropriately. And I've got a couple of other roles as well. Um, I work on the um, Auckland Medical Research Foundation. I'm the co-deputy chair of the medical committee, so I'm involved in assessing grant applications. And um, most recently, I've taken on a role uh, with our college as an examiner. So um, I guess what I was wanting to let you know about was that, you know, whilst you may not know what you want to grow up, <laughs> I'm sure that you will find a pathway forward. And I think the main if I could offer you any advice, it's just about being, you know, listening to yourself and being true to yourself because ultimately, you know, 
we have long careers ahead of us. I, I still feel like I've got you know, another 20, 30, 40 years in the tank, and you guys are just at the very beginning. So be true to yourself and find what makes your heart sing, because really there are so many potential work opportunities within healthcare. Um, don't limit yourself to clinical jobs if you think that actually that isn't working for you, because there are so many ways that you can use your really valuable, important knowledge that you and skills from your medical degree and apply those skills in a way that is useful for you, but also useful for our community. Thank you. I don't think I knew that much about my boss. Nice to hear that now. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. That was, that was fantastic and a lot of common themes coming through. Okay, now we're going to hear from, from a young fella, um, Noah Bunkley, who is just about to start his journey, or just starting his journey in public health as a public health um, trainee registrar. Um, so Noah's with us in the uh, School of Population Health. Um, so nice to have you along, Noah. Thanks, boys. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Noah, uh, born in the US, raised in Wanganui, and studied medicine at the University of Auckland. So it actually hasn't been that long since I was sitting in your place um, in the public health intensive week. Um, I am still going on my journey, I'm still trying to figure out where I will end up in public health. There are so many different areas that you can go into, so many different um, specialties, skills you can develop, um, that I, I'm just going to present to you what I have done so far, um, how I ended up as a public health registrar, and a few of the projects that I've worked on along the way. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the Registrar Training Program as well, for anyone who's um, interested in that, but I believe you'll be having a bit more information on that at another time. So yeah, I, I entered medicine, like a lot of us do, with the idea that I want to help people. Um, I initially thought, I, and, and I also wanted to travel, so I initially thought I wanted to do uh, Doctors Without Borders, be an emergency medicine doctor, um, try and save the world uh, one patient at a time. Um, and then as I progressed through medicine, uh, my first experience with public health was actually the public health intensive week. And a lot of things really clicked together in this week. Um, I saw that you can actually make a really big difference by changing the environment in which people live in rather than dealing with people on an individual level. Um, so if you can make even a small difference at a population level, it can really make a large difference across the population. Um, and then that really was emphasized when I went and did my elective in Tanzania. Um, and so there I worked in a, a rural poor hospital um, that didn't have any of the resources. They had doctors there, but they didn't have any of the resources to actually implement uh, the medical treatment. Uh, for example, they had, um, there, were, there were two patients per bed um, at times because they were just so full. Um, they ran out of x-ray film. They didn't have lubricant for catheter insertions. Um, so it was just, that made me realize that it's really often what needs to happen is a change in the systems that we live in um, rather than working on the individual basis. Um, and then after that, I was reconsidering what I wanted to do. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing surgery. Um, so I just, and because I was still unsure, I decided to do um, a B Med site honors. Um, and that was right after my fifth year, between fifth and sixth year. Uh, it was actually through the surgical department, but it really had a big public health flavor. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail with some pictures. Um, and then I worked as a house officer in Tauranga, and I had the opportunity to work at Toy Toyota, the public health unit. Uh, before joining the public health training program. So I will go through some of the projects that I've worked on just to give you a bit of flavor as to what a public health registrar does almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'll try and do that with some pictures. So my honors project uh, involved, and then this, so this is really where I, I realized that I wanted to do public health. Um, was when I was looking towards surgery and then got involved in a household survey looking at access to surgical care in Vanuatu, which really is uh, much more of a public health focus. Um, and so what I did was uh, developed a survey, 
went over to Vanuatu, piloted the survey, and you can see all those little dots there were the households that we had to go visit. Um, and so we went and visited them and asked them questions about their ability to access surgical care. And so this is really public health and practice, going out into the communities and asking them and uh, gathering information about um, their ability to access medical care. Um, and so I did it with some of the um, Ni Vanuatu people. Um, There's a bit of a, a tra training session involved, um, and we went and conducted the survey. And by definition, um, identifying barriers to access, we had to go and access areas that were really difficult to access. Um, so that often involves uh, driving from one side of the island to the other, getting on a boat to then go to another outlying island, driving another few hours to the end of the road, and then walking to reach some of these really remote um, households to then conduct the survey. Um, and this was just after Cyclone Pam, and so there was some, some of the devastation that, um, uh, that wrought in Vanuatu. So after that, after being really inspired that public health is this cool, um, specialty that I can go and try and change the world. Um, I went and became a house officer in Tauranga. Um, and luckily, they had just started uh, the house officer placements at Toitioro, which is the public health unit there. And so I had the opportunity to spend three months um, in public health in Toitioro, which was an amazing opportunity. If anyone is considering doing public health, I would recommend um, trying to uh, have a house officer placement in uh, one of the public health units. It really gives you a great um, uh, exposure to public health um, and some really good, build some really good public health skills. And so while I was at Toyota, I um, was involved in a range of different activities. I um, presented at a district uh, alcohol licensing committee. Um, I did a project looking at access to green spaces and quality of green spaces. Um, and I did an audit of smoke-free signage around Tauranga parks um, and bus stations. At the time, they had a bylaw that um, uh, mandated that a lot of the, that the signage at parks and bus stations had to have smoke-free signage. Um, so I went around and did an audit of that. And so you can see the smoke-free signage is there. Some of them um, <laughs> were less than ideal. <laughs> uh, and I did. I conducted this in the most public health way possible. Um, zero emissions, active transport on uh, an electric bike. Um, and then presented the results to Tauranga Council, um, which uh, then went and rectified uh, some of the areas that did not have the smoke-free signage. And so even as a house officer, I felt like I was making a difference, even on a small scale. Um, and so after that, I joined the New Zealand College of Public Health Medicine. Um, so I can talk a bit about the training program. Um, it is a four-year training program. I am currently in my third year after doing uh, my master's last year. Uh, the master's is a one-and-a-half-year training program, a uh, one-and-a-half-year course, which uh, is actually a, a two-year master program that you do in a year and a half. Um, so quite intense, but really valuable. Um, you do get paid to do the masters, so that is um, something to keep in mind, that you can actually survive while studying. <laughs> um, and then once you do your masters, you do two and a half years of uh, registrar placements. Um, and so from those placements, there need to be three different placements, and one of those has to be in a public health unit. So I have just finished my, oh, so I'll first talk about my um, masters. Just to give you a bit of um, an idea of the breadth of public health. So um, from one moment I was looking at smoke-free signage in Tauranga, the next moment I was analyzing and conducting qualitative um, analysis of international trade and investment agreements and their impact on nutrition policies in small island developing states in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Um, so I know that's quite a bit of a mouthful and takes a bit to digest, but basically is the idea that these international trade agreements that we have signed up to, that a lot of nations have signed up to, that um, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, are in charge of, they can limit 
the ability of countries to actually implement their own nutrition policies, their own healthy nutrition policies, such as front of package labeling um, and sugar sweetened beverage taxes, things like that. Um, and so that was really interesting. Uh, through the masters, I gained a really good um, grounding in research skills, in um, policy, and in public health thinking, which is much more of a, a systems level, wider thinking, um, taking into account the social determinants of health and the commercial determinants of health. And then after that, I joined the Auckland Public Health Unit, um, which uh, has, is, is home to the medical officers of health. Um, and they do a range of, uh, they have a whole range of different um, tasks that they, that they manage, um, particularly environmental infectious disease management. Um, and so while I was at ARFS, I was heavily involved in that area, taking all the notifications that come through from the hospitals, from the GPs, and then managing those. And so those would be things like uh, meningococcal disease, um, Legionella, lead poisoning, um, they would come through to the public health unit, and then we would decide what to do from there. So for example, um, meningococcal, uh, we get a case that comes through from the hospital. Um, it's really important that we action that rapidly to um, prevent any further risk of, menin of the contacts developing meningococcal. Um, and so we would then go to identify all the contacts, deliver antibiotics and immunizations to those contexts to, to re reduce their risk of also developing meningococcal. Um, while at ARFS, I did a project looking at the BCG immunization program um, and evaluated that from an equity perspective. I uh, looked at the Auckland air pollution policy, or I looked at um, air pollution in Auckland and developed some policy recommendations. Um, so a lot of us may not know that air pollution in Auckland is actually a significant problem. Um, air pollution in New Zealand kills about 3,300 people per year, um, and air pollution in Auckland kills about 900 people per year. And so that's almost uh, one-tenth of all deaths in New Zealand. Um, and there isn't much that we are doing to reduce air pollution in this country. Um, the WHO put out some new recommendations in 2021. Uh, that sh and with those recommendations, over 90% of people living in Auckland are actually exposed to air pollution at levels higher uh, than the acceptable guidelines set up by the WHO. Um, so I'm still in the process of working um, to get those policy recommendations into practice. Um, and then while I was at ARFS, there was also the MPOX outbreak, which I helped to coordinate and lead. Um, and that was a great experience of just understanding how much public health work is actually part of a team. It's teamwork. We had public health nurses, um, media specialists, uh, the, the data analysts, all working together to try and control the MPOX outbreak. And so I, I don't have many pictures from ARFS, but I did try to insert some of them. Um, I was also involved in an environmental health risk assessment. So this is a photo of the Hanua Ranges. Um, there was a 1080 uh, operation in the Hanua Ranges last year, and public health is involved in that because the Hanua Ranges are um, accessible by the public. Um, following a 1080 operation, there is always a risk that the public comes into contact with 1080, and so we were involved in making sure that the risk was acceptably low. Um, and that involved field visits um, and walking around the Hanuas, which is pretty good. <laughs> pretty good for a day job. Um, and this is a picture from working with the sexual health team um, in the MPOX uh, vaccination clinics. Um, and so that was a huge job where we brought together um, a diverse group of people from different specialties to come together to um, really vaccinate um, a vulnerable community. And now I'm working at the University of Auckland um, on an international research project. I'm just starting my PhD, um, and also uh, this is going to be my second placement um, for my uh, training. And so what we are going to be doing here uh, is look at the impact of a cool roof material, which is a hyper-reflective paint-like material that gets applied to roofs. 
Um, I know this doesn't sound like medicine, <laughs> but the idea is that it reduces indoor air temperatures, and for places that are impacted by extreme heat, this can have a significant impact by reducing extreme heat-related diseases such as stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes. Um, and so some of these places get up to 45, 50 degrees, uh, don't have access to air conditioning, um, and so, and have tin roofs, which are super heat absorptive, so indoor air temperatures are even higher. Um, and so some of the places that we're working in, in Mexico, uh, Burkina Faso, India, and Niue. And so my research will be specifically focused in Niue, but it is part of this um, broader research group. Um, and so here are some photos of what we're doing to try to reduce indoor air temperatures for some of these communities. Um, and so, yeah, that's my journey. Um, again, I'm still figuring out exactly where I'll end up in public health, um, but there are lots of different things you can do, um, lots of different opportunities. So thank you. Good, okay, thanks very much, um, Noah. So listen, if I can get uh, the three of you um, just to come through up here, that would be great. Um, we have got um, Northland online, Pukawakawa, but um, first of all, what a, what, a, what a set of journeys. I think you must have heard the word journey many times. Um, and yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to mention at the beginning, and somebody did mention it, that uh, really Ashley has put uh, public health and um, epidemiology on the map. I don't think the public really knew what public health was or epidemiology before COVID, and now they do. We didn't get an inundation of uh, discussion about COVID. I think maybe that's part we're trying to repress that memory, but we did hear a bit of that from, from Dune, but obviously that has been totally dominating over the last few years. But what did break through was this wide variety. I like this concept of whole of systems physicians. It means we need to do some systems um, training here. Um, different pathways, some aha moments, um, asking the hard questions, lots about values, about equity, Maori Pacific um, and equities across countries as well. We heard a lot about multidisciplinary working in teams, um, data analytics for population health, a wide variety of roles, the need for flexibility, and that it's okay to weave your way through your career as you're finding out uh, what you're doing um, until you find what makes your heart sing. I like that. Um, and then Noah showing us um, all the places from um, Vanuatu houses to parks to roofs. So um, these might seem a little distant from your clinical medicine, but they're all, all a fundamental part of, of medicine. All right, so now we've got a chance to quiz these wonderful people, and we're going to... Um Testing. 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 Okay, we're going to start off with a question from Pukawakao. I told them that I was going to ask them first, and they got in ahead of me, and they already put in their question before we started. So, Anna, can you <laughs> read out what their, uh, their question is? Right, they're asking, how can public health physicians service Northland communities more equitably into the future? Um, First of all, get some public health physicians there. Well, I was going to say, exactly. So I think one of the exciting opportunities with the health reforms is taking a whole-of-country approach to allocation of scarce resources, and that includes um, public health uh, professionals and public health physicians. Um, so what I'm hopeful for is that, appreciating that this is not going to happen overnight, um, but that we will have more of a rational approach to allocation, to allocation of resources according to need by community, which has been difficult to implement under the district health board structure. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think they've raised a really important point, uh, and, and it is 
particularly for a place like Northland where we've got um, a high Māori population often in quite distant, um, you know, kind of rural communities, distant from healthcare, but also in terms of supporting those communities around some of the on the ground kind of public and population health stuff that we've been talking about. Um, I think the other, um, th there's the, the national opportunity, but it's that ongoing, and we were talking earlier about the kind of tensions that often exist in a public health space, and certainly going forward, the, the tension of having things that are nationally, trying to have national consistency and national leadership and do things once and well where it's appropriate to have a national framework about something, but at the same time be reflecting local community <coughs> need and aspirations and how we can tailor things in a local community. And so I think that's something that's going to be an ongoing thing that we are going to be working out, as, as many social sector and kind of government agencies have to do actually all across the country, is actually get, get that kind of balance. And, it is really, we were talking earlier actually with Boyd about even things like, um, you know, alcohol policy, how we continue to amplify the voice of our local communities while also recognising that there's, um, you know, a system now where there's going to be national leadership about how we submit on alcohol policies when sale and supply of liquor act is being reviewed. There will be a whole national process gathering up voices from across the country, but somehow in gathering it up, we need to not lose the importance and the power actually of local community voice into that. And particularly, I, I mean, the other thing is actually, you know, being able to honour our Tetsuriti responsibilities, thinking, you know, for many of those Northern communities, how, how we do that appropriately and realise that they have a really strong, you know, Māori workforce across many of those communities, but they're also stretched really thin. And we, we, risk kind of asking for their voice into all kinds of things that are really important but actually there's just a limit to how much so you know again how we support and work um, in that space is going to be really important. Okay thanks for that now uh, over to you for questions for to quiz these people okay why don't you shout out your question and we'll repeat the question so the people online can um, can hear it yeah. Okay, so for those online, the question was about the uh, training program described as boutique. I guess that means it's hard to get into. Um, and what does it mean? What does boutique mean? Okay, well, Noah will start off on that. And what's the pay like, Noah? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, no, that, that, that is a good question. Um, so the training program is very flexible. Um, they pride themselves <coughs> in being a very flexible training program. There are currently some changes occurring in the training program, so I can't speak to those, but I can speak to how it is at the moment. Things may be different by the time you're ready to join. Um, so over the, so it, it's a four-year training program, but you can do it part-time, and actually a lot of the trainees do it part-time. The minimum requirement for part-time is uh, 0.4 FTE, um, and you can take breaks over that time. Um, maximum is up to one year at a time. Um, and I think you can, uh, th there, there is a limit to the training. I believe it, it's, it's 10 years. I think it's 10 years. I don't think anyone has ever reached that limit. Um, so it is a very flexible training program. In terms of the placements, uh, at the moment it is very flexible in that you go and find placements that you're interested in um, and then apply. Um, the placements will need to fund you, um, but the college does provide some additional funding for the organizations to support you as a registrar. Um, in terms of the placements, the only requirement is that you have to do at least six months with a public health unit, 
and the other two years you can do wherever, basically. Most people work in, or have previously worked in the DHBs, um, have worked in um, the Ministry of Health, um, or um, for me, for example, working at the university now. So there, there are lots of options. Um, you can work, I think, up to a year overseas um, and get that accounted for your training, but you have to have a New Zealand College of Public Health Medicine specialist supervisor to support that. Um, in terms of the pay, <laughs> it's uh, a 40-hour work week, so uh, no weekends or uh, evenings, no nights. Except in COVID. Except in COVID, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> uh, and so that's reflected in the pay. <laughs> you know, people, I don't think you've heard money. They're in for, for the money uh, from any of their journeys. So that, that comes down to your values. Any others about anything else oh, about the training say, program? If you, if you work uh, in terms of the financial side of things, if you work for, like when I was working for a DHB, I was just on the standard SMO contract. So, you know, that's comparable to other specialists, although, as um, Noah said, you know, not with, without being on call and with additional payments for those sorts of activities. Um, working at the university is a whole other story. Um, I mean, I've taken a, quite a substantial pay, hit, pay cut to work at the university, um, but, you know, that's my choice. Um, there are some people who work in private consulting, consulting within public health. Uh, you know, we have colleagues who work for PwC, um, Ernst Young, um, and I'm presuming that they'll be earning, uh, you know, reasonably healthy salaries. And some people do private consulting work. Um, so, for instance, you can undertake contracts through the government tender website, and I'm sure that those people would be on reasonably attractive um, financial packages. And, and just picking up in terms of the potential changes, so as Noah said, the, there's been the flexibility of kind of finding your own roles. I guess there's also been a, a challenge in there for people at times because they've wanted to, you know, work in a Māori provider or an NGO that hasn't been able to actually then come up with a salary for them to be able to do that. And so there is, actually thanks to Ashley and COVID, uh, there is further investment into the training programme at the moment. And so some of the options that are being looked at are how we can actually facilitate that so that actually, particularly in the NGO space, people can be doing things where those organisations don't actually have to find the funding then for that. And the, and the support in terms of having like a specialist to be doing the supervision and stuff so really trying to make improve the equity opportunities actually of, of placements as well. Um, and I think the other kind of opportunity in there is, um, as Vanessa said, if you're in a DHB setting, we've been on the Mecca. Uh, and so again, ways to kind of think about the training program and also when people are at the other end about how that's, but, but I think it would be fair to say that most people are not in it for the money uh, and so it's that you know, balance of enough to you know, do what people want it to do and a very strong kind of values driven I guess reasons mostly. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, can I just make one yep. extra point, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the flexibility side of things, um, I mean, uh, building on what Noah was talking about in terms of flexibility of the training program, I mean, I've, I'm in the luxurious position, to be perfectly honest, of being able to, you know, short of having to turn up for a talk like this where my physical <laughs> presence is needed, I've got a lot of flexibility in terms of how I do my work. Um, so, you know, I've got kids, I've got 11-year-old twins, um, I can drop, generally I can drop things if I need to, to go and pick them up and do what I need to, go to elderly parents, um, you know, hospital appointments and things like that. So I've actually in quite a privileged position in terms of having flexibility around my weekdays, which I know a lot of my colleagues don't have. Um, and that's also something that's, you know, is important to consider. Yeah, I think the, uh, the training program was going through a bit of a lull until COVID came along and people saw the value of public health and public health physicians. So I think it has picked up its act um, a bit. Anybody online want to put any questions in? You got one there? Okay. Yep. Okay, we've got one saying, in your opinion, collective, 
Do you believe an increase in minimum basic parent slash whanau income would improve the environment for children in Aotearoa? Sorry, an increase of what, Anna? Income. Parents, family income. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Dorothy Dixon question. That's a pretty, pretty fundamental. Anyone want to elaborate on that? I mean, I guess what I would sort of say is that um, <clears throat> thinking about health from a population health perspective has made me very political. I mean, it's basically really transformed my thinking around the way in which we should be running our country and the way our country is moving forward. I guess what concerns me is the stark and increasing inequities that we have in our society, not just from a health perspective, but in terms of financial home ownership incomes, especially when we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis. So, I mean, I guess the other thing I would be saying is that we're not just, <clears throat> I guess, um, our part of our day job isn't just thinking about um, health, but actually being an advocate for health, and part of being an advocate for health is actually advocating for decent incomes, which are a critical first step towards um, health. Housing, education, employment, and, and I mean, it is a challenge too when we think about investment in health care, you know, the government pot is also limited in totality, and so the more we cry out for more investment in health care, you know, that is investment that then can't go into housing and education and employment. Um, so there is also, you know, one of the many tensions that I guess we kind of live with in that space. And there was actually, I think, um, is it Fuko, some famous person in the past said that public health is politics writ large. <laughs> um, and so, as Vanessa said, you can't kind of help but end up being much more interested in politics than you probably ever were. Yeah, and I absolutely um, echo um, those statements. And, uh, just, just add that it, it all comes down to the, the determinants of health. Um, income is one of those, um, family, housing, um, all the environments that we live in. Those social and economic uh, determinants of health definitely impact people's um, health and well-being. You know, we've just been through a, an exercise um, with about 50 or 60 um, nutrition experts in the country to analyse what is happening or not happening uh, within within this country on public health policies around food and what we should do about it. And we went through a whole process, workshops and so on with these um, experts. And this is nutrition experts, if one of the top things they came out with, people need to have sufficient income to be able to buy food, healthy food for themselves without having to rely on handouts and, and food parcels and so on. So I think this is emerging as a really top political, uh, top issue and it's a political issue. You can't help but be involved in the politics of it, not necessarily the party politics, but the politics of allocation of resources. Okay. And, sorry, sorry. And, and maybe just to, so there's all of that bigger policy stuff, but also thinking about the patient in front in front of you when you are trying to, you know, have a conversation about their long-term condition management, for instance, that actually the priorities in their life may actually be just having enough income to have a roof over their head tomorrow for their kids to get safely to school and have some kai in a lunchbox for them, uh, that actually they, they need kai to food to feed their family that night. And the quality of that kai yeah. um, is going to be really important for their, for their whanau as well. So just kind of thinking about the context of, of the stuff that's going on in their lives as well as trying to solve all the big policy questions, that actually those things are going to be really important in terms of how they're going to actually be able to respond to what you're actually having that conversation about. Okay, thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, like, so, like, obviously how you mentioned, public health is very politics involved. Um, I guess, how do you sort of keep yourself grounded and sort of not get frustrated when, like, it's very clear-cut research shows this, but at the end of the day, the decision comes down to politics? I used to have hair back in the day. <laughs> I swear a lot. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, the best advice I got about dealing with that was from one of um, my wonderful colleagues, Tom Robinson. Um, and he said, Vanessa, what you have to re remember, this is when I was expressing frustration, probably using some very salty language, is that with public, the health system is like this giant tanker. 
and you can't expect to just change direction quickly and that actually um, he said Vanessa you need to think about yourself as being one person in a team that's trying to push it in a better direction so I think actually having an appreciation of that and that it wasn't all on my shoulders and that I can't expect major changes but to keep pushing with a group of people in the same direction so I think I guess one thing is timing um, sometimes actually something will happen in the environment that means that you can actually implement something quickly that may not have been possible. For instance, what happened with COVID in terms of how that transformed our ability to deliver, to deliver healthcare. Suddenly, you know, we don't, need our, we don't need to go to the GP to get a script or it doesn't have to get faxed. Suddenly we can, you know, the GP can have a teleconsult, they can send their script to the pharmacy and you just have to go and pick it up. So actually sometimes these things happen in society where big changes can happen quickly. Generally, not necessarily, but I think the other important thing is being part of a group of similar thinking people. So trying to, and, the, and I think this is important no matter which part of medicine you end up working in, actually finding people who've got similar values to you, who you can um, share thoughts and ideas with and maintain your momentum and positive, constructive way forward through it to avoid getting frustrated. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm still early in my career, so I'm still idealistic. Um, <laughs> so just keep pushing and pushing. You know, follow, follow what you believe and keep pushing forward. You're a great question, though. Yeah. The other thing, maybe just yeah. to, in terms of you know, the fact that it's very political, is also just um, working out for yourself you know, kind of where you are okay about sitting in the system. Because I mean, I'm part of a system which is bound to nowhere in three months leading up to when the election. There are rules about what public servants can do and not do in terms of speaking out and being political and stuff. Um, so you just you do have to be mindful of that, and so you have to work out, you know, how how and where you feel comfortable in sitting in that space. I mean, we were really fortunate at when we were counties. Our, our senior legal advisor was very helpful with us in terms of saying it is absolutely your responsibility to speak out on the things that you believe are important for the health of the people that you serve in this community. It's about not being political when you do that. So Not being party political. Not being party political, then. sorry, yes, not being party political. So even like Chloe Swarbrick's bill, not talking about as Chloe's bill, but actually talking about the bill and what it was about so that it's clear that actually you're talking about that in a neutral kind of way. So some of that is, you know, and people, some people just wouldn't want to work in an organisation where they were going to be hamstrung in any way. And I remember actually back in the day when Boyd was doing some piece of advocacy and there was this whole email trail and I was one of like two people with a DHB email on that trail and I had to go back without reply or at one point and say to Boyd, look, you know I support this but actually I can't add my name to that particular thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is a bit tricky, especially for people working inside the system because all of these things are, are political, um, but that's, that's kind of the nature of, of medicine uh, writ large, I think. Okay, any other questions or comments about public health or population health in action? Is someone up there? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So the, so the question is whether it's helpful to have a clinical background before going into public health or not? I, I think that, you know, as we said, there are many different kinds of people and professions and stuff in the public health space. I think we have a particular contribution to make because of our medical training and then depending on how much clinical work you do as to kind of what you bring in, in your kitty. Um, Margie Upper, who is now CE of Tafatua, New Zealand, she, when we were part of her team, she was always really clear at how much she valued the fact that we were clinicians and that we could have conversations with other clinicians with some credibility and that when we were doing the kind of wider advocacy stuff and trying to, again, trying to amplify the voice of our communities, we got to speak into spaces you know, and elevate that voice in ways that we might not have done if we hadn't actually been clinicians. So I think, um, you know, 
there are lots of different people that are an important part of the public health picture and we, we have something to offer in this space. I think if, if you're thinking about doing another specialty first and switching into public health medicine, um, that, that's a valid way to do it, but it's not necessary. Um, I went in after PGY3. Um, I initially thought I'd do emergency medicine, get burnt out and switch to public health. Um, <laughs> decided that was a bad idea. <laughs> and switched to public health and um, no, no regrets. <laughs> And the other thing you can do is actually stay in your clinical specialty and practice like probably the people that you saw mm. on Monday. And I'm just thinking like emergency physicians. So I've worked, ended up working really closely with an amazing, amazing emergency physician as part of the COVID response, who really practices in such a public health way. She's done, um, she does stuff with MFAT and deployed overseas, setting up field hospitals and doing all kinds of, not actually medicines on frontiers, but you know, into that space. But, but importantly, in that she brings her system thinking, but she's also very, you know, social determinants, all of that kind of stuff. So you can actually take all of that kind of thinking and practice actually into clinical specialties. And actually, that's amazing. Like, we really need those people, actually. So I think it's good to say we're not here to convince you to do public health we're here to talk about it, but also really encourage you to think about how you can practice as a population health practitioner, actually in whatever area of clinical medicine that we end up. Um, I have, I have foretold to these people that they, throughout their career, will be drift to, drifting towards population health, whether they like it or not, or whether they become specialists or not, just as you start to see the bigger picture. So um, that, that clinical population health interface that we heard about on Monday, I think, is another real, really positive way to contribute to population health. And when you talk about specialists, you are including general practitioners, yeah, specialists, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> Both the GPs. Okay, any other final comments in that one from Pukaka? Any other final comments or questions? All right, people, I'm just going to come and um, pick on somebody at random um, to uh, just reflect on what they've heard from this wonderful panel and to uh, how they think it might apply to them or, or thoughts that have been stirred within them and to uh, thank the panel members. So, um, who's the lucky person? Okay, where are we going? Okay, you're safe, you're safe. Where are we going? Okay, oh no, no, here we are on the corner here. Okay, <laughs> speaking to that little one. <laughs> Um, thank you for your talk today. That was very insightful. And I think what I got from today is how flexible and important your work is in um, tackling the bigger issues of health in society. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, folks, that's all good, and we'll see some of you at 12 o'clock, and good luck for the rest of the week. Okay, thanks, guys. Look at these guys.